All right. Let's see. Apologies. Let me uh, just getting a few things kind of pulled up here. Give me one moment, and we'll get started shortly. Got to clean up the uh, editor from last time. Okay, cool. Looks good. <coughs> Let me just check the stream here. So, uh, as usual, welcome to Study Hall. Uh, this is a venue for you all to ask questions. Uh, you can ask questions. The, there's sort of a live chat, as it were, in the uh, Slack channel under the um, uh, thread that I posted in uh, the Study Hall uh, Slack channel. Um, so if you're signed up for that, go ahead and head over there. And feel free to put in a question. I'm not seeing a question at the moment, uh, so I'm going to assume that we're good to go. Um, but yeah, just uh, the way this works, if you're new, because I know we just started a new cohort, so I, uh, I'll just kind of explain it for uh, for new folks if you're coming in from Premium Prep. Um, the way this works, you'll just uh, post a link to the problem, You know, maybe provide your code or any other, uh, you know, bits or pieces that uh, you're not understanding, just a description of what, you, what you'd what you like help with, and I'll follow the link and go through the problem. Um, maybe I'll debug your code. Um, you know, we'll play by ear and whatever, whatever we want to do in that regard. Cool. So since I'm not seeing anything at the moment, um, we will just go through the material. Uh, so last time we went through, oops, we went through tuples. We went pretty in depth with tuples. Excuse me, my throat's a little dry. Apologies. Sorry about that. Um, last time we went pretty in depth with tuples, and we got through all the tuple material. Uh, so this time, uh, we're going to be going through sets. I think I talked a little bit about these. But I'll, I'll go over these, again, just kind of the basic concept of sets. Um, so sets, I think, can be uh, potentially, oops, what do we have here? Oh, that's a little different. It looks like, sorry, uh, my Adam got changed to a different. Uh, instance of the editor. One second, let me switch back. Apologies. Okay, that 
should do. All right, sorry about that. Um, so, just trying to get reoriented here. Uh, yeah, I'll go over sets a little bit again. So, sets can feel a lot like uh, lists or tuples um, in that they, you know, if I print a set off, it, it kind of looks like a list or a tuple. Uh, you know, a list uses square brackets, a tuple uses parentheses, and then a set uses curly brackets like a, like a dictionary does. Um, and since it doesn't have key value pairs like a dictionary, it ends up kind of looking visually when you print it off or you look at it, kind of looks like a list or a tuple. But um, the jobs that a set does are pretty different than uh, a list or a tuple. So. Uh, sets don't obey an order, so the elements, the, the order in which you place elements into a set is not necessarily the order in which they're going to come out. You can think about it like um, uh, a string or a list or a tuple has an order like if you arrange items on a shelf from left to right, um, you know, if, if there was books on a shelf and I said ha hand me the third book on the shelf, you'd probably start at the left and count one, two, three books in and take that off and hand me the third book. Um, with a set, it doesn't look, work like that. It's more like a, um, like a bucket or, you know, some container of, of items that are all just piled in together. Uh, or that's, that's a better analogy, right? Um, so I always use the, the analogy of a jar of jelly beans or something. So it, what would it mean to have the, you know, to, find the 15th jelly bean in the jar. Kind of doesn't mean anything, right? So uh, all the jelly beans are in the jar. We just know all the jelly beans are in that jar. Um, so that's one thing about a set is that the order isn't preserved. Um, I've noticed that you will, I, th I think this will happen with smaller sets. Um, you will see the set printed off if you print it off or if you iterate through it. With smaller sets, you can often see it come out in the same order every time. Um, and often it'll be sorted, although I've seen exceptions to that too, I think with larger, more complicated sets. But if you just have a set with a few numbers in it or a few words in it or something, uh, they'll, they'll come out in a sorted order often. Um, but not always. So we, we even if the order seems consistent, you don't really want to ever think about a set as having an order. You don't ever want to count on that uh, order being uh, actually um, reliable. Um, so yeah, so that's that's one major component uh, about a set that makes it different than lists and tuples. Which you know you could lists and tuples are pretty similar. They can basically do all the tasks of the other one at least on a high level, right? We can. We can model data and store data and, you know, uh, do operations that are similar uh, with lists and, and similar, likewise similar with tuples. But, um, yeah, sets are, sets are different in that regard, partly because they are unordered, like I just described. Um, another big difference is that they cannot contain duplicate items. So... You know, if I have a list with, uh, I'll just use this list, like 4, 3, 4, 5, 4, 8, 5, 4. Uh, I've got a few 5s and a few 4s in here. Um, if I made this into a set, and we'll just print this off, like that. Um, the duplicates get removed. Ah, see, all, all that, so much for me talking about how they are ordered often, right? So this, or sorted, this didn't come out in sorted order this time, which is really interesting. Because almost always it does. <laughs> so it's, I, maybe it's only when I, 
when I mention that uh, it will usually come out in a sorted order, that it won't come out in a sorted order. That seems likely. Some sort of Murphy's Law phenomenon. Um, right, so when we turn this list into a set, which we can do, we can cast it as a set just like that using the set function, print it off, um, regardless of the order, the order doesn't matter, uh, it does not contain duplicates. So we're just interested in, with a set, uh, it just tells us what objects are a member of the set, what values are members of the set, uh, but not their quantities and not their order, right? So that's the big, those are kind of the, the big two things, is that they are unordered and they only contain unique items which means no duplicates. So that being said, um, being that they don't have an order, they can't be uh, indexed or sliced. We can't get a, uh, it, it's meaningless to say give me the the element at index 2, which would be 4 if this was a list, but there is no index 2, there are no indices in a set. Um, it's meaningless because this order is subject to change, right? Python has decided that it, it wanted to give me back this object in this order this time. Um, I don't know, maybe if I reset the, uh, yeah, it's not gonna matter. It's resetting anyways with the file watcher that I'm using, so. Uh, I used to, it used to have sort of a more random <laughs> ordering uh, so every time I'd run it, it would it would often come out in a different order. But um, I wonder if I add another element to it. Maybe maybe that'll do it. Ah, look at that. So this time it gave it to me back in a sorted format. Three, four, five, eight, nine. Right. So you can see, you know, if there's a change to it, um, the ordering just goes right out the window. You know, this ordering, this initial ordering, does does not really resemble the uh, the next ordering. They're not really like each other. So, um, yeah, that's a phenomenon. So, being that they're unordered, they don't have indices, they are not useful for storing information that you intend to later retrieve. Uh, therefore, I tend to kind of think about them as sort of a secondary type in a way. Um, they have some un unique abilities, and we'll get into that in a second here. They have some really cool things that they can do. Um, and we, we covered, you know, this is all kind of a recap. O obviously, if you were at the last study hall, you probably remember me going over this stuff. But I think it's worth uh, going over again because it's useful stuff. Um, so they have some unique abilities, and we'll get into that in a second, but uh, their their abilities are not <laughs> really very much like lists and tuples, even though aesthetically they seem to resemble lists and tuples. Um, you know, I would say, I would say a dictionary, even though a dictionary looks different than a list or a tuple, a dictionary has more overlap in terms of the jobs that it can do and that it's well suited for. Uh, has more overlap with lists and tuples than a set does. So in terms of like where each type is useful, um, like maybe if I was going to do some some sort of grouping of these, I'd say, you know, lists and tuples, uh, tuples and dictionaries are here and sets are kind of out here, right? So they're they're pretty divergent in terms of what they're useful for. Not that they're not useful, they're just, they just do a very different job. Okay, um, so the way I tend to think about using these is, you know, I, I process my data in whatever lists or uh, um, tuples, or dictionaries, and that's where things are like more or less stored. That's like where those are the structures that I use to to model things and to kind of you know move things around, move data around, and kind of understand the world. Whereas I will 
I'll take like um, maybe the keys or values of a dictionary or a tuple or a list and I'll cast it to a set when I want to do the things that sets are strong at. Um, so yeah, that's the way I tend to think about this. So the way, and I, you know, sets kind of can use these. If you look, they're represented with uh, curly brackets like this, kind of like dictionaries are. When, when I declare a new set, generally, and what I recommend is to use the set constructor function like this. Um, and that's because Python, if there's any ambiguity between the curly brackets being a set or a dictionary, it will assume dictionary. So if you want to use a set, uh, if you use the set constructor function to make an empty set, for example, it's unambiguous. Python will always know what that is. Uh, and I also use it, I also don't use it in the, the literal form as often, in this literal form with the curly brackets as often, because I do think of it kind of as a secondary type. Uh, I think about it as something that I cast other types to when it's useful to do so. Uh, so I just sort of think about it as, you know, being a secondary type. So rather than using it in its literal format, even though there is a, 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 a set literal in Python, I use the set function just to make things clear, right? So cool. Um, looks like we got a question here. Why all the types? Why not make one type that does everything? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I think there are there are languages that attempt this. Um, so I'm there's a I won't claim to be a uh, an expert in Lua like I am in Python, um, but I've recently dabbled around in Lua a little bit. And from what I can tell, they have, so Lua has, if you look at Lua's data types, they broadly resemble Python's until you get to lists. And they ha Lua has a type called a table, um, which from what I can tell at least uh, kind of supplements for lists and dictionaries simultaneously. Um, so it's sort of like it's sort of like a super powerful list that you can you can arbitrarily assign like uh, overwrite the automatically generated indices with your own keys. So it's like a if you don't supply keys, it'll assume indices. If you do supply keys, it'll override those indices with the keys. Or it might add the keys in. The indices might still be be usable but um, so it's an ordered collection type that is really broad and and powerful and um, I was kind of playing around with Lua a couple months ago and it was, um, it was a cool language um, I I just kind of got diverted into other things but um, yeah I, so I don't fully understand that but I think that's sort of an attempt at, at I think what you're talking about having a, a type that does a variety of things um, one thing about that though um, you know, think about the difference between tuples and lists, uh, which is essentially, you can think about them as like, let's build a tool that's good for the same kinds of things. Uh, we'll just build an immutable one and a mutable one. Um, it's kind of hard to, if you have one type, you have to make a choice around that, right? Like that type is either mutable or it's immutable. And you could argue, well, you know, if you don't want mutability, then be careful, you know, copy, be careful to copy your your uh, um, types and operate on copies, you know, leaves it to the user to do copying manually rather than having copying kind of inferred and done for you. Um, I mean, there's an argument for that as a design philosophy. 
but there's also an argument, a counter argument for the opposite, right? Maybe the assumption should be, well, you know, maybe you should have to opt in to mutability rather than opting out of mutability. So which assumption do you make? Which which uh, behavior by default should it have? Should it be mutable by default or immutable by default? And I could I could I could uh, frankly argue both sides in a in in different contexts, right? Um, if I were, for example, maybe if I were if I were going to make a a low level language, maybe like C or something, something uh, like Rust, uh, something that operated on on compiled language that operated on on bare metal, I might choose that that type should be mutable by default. Uh, if I were going to make a high level language like Python, I'd, I'd probably lean into like functional programming myself and uh, I would I would probably choose immutability by default and you know kind of hide mutability behind abstractions uh, try to automate it away from the the user as much as possible and you know if you did want to opt into it then you did, might have to go through some hurdle like deliberate hurdles to, to do that right so um, but my point is if you were gonna make one type to rule them all you'd need to make some assumption about that. Um, or it would have to be like configurable and you would have to like, it would, you know, you could think about the type being like a matrix of options, right? Um, and that is actually one way to think about these types, right? Um, mutable or immutable, ordered uh, or unordered, right? So those are two would those be columns or rows? Or, I don't know. Uh, and then another one would be, or dimensions. Um, and then another one would be uh, keyed or indexed or neither, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, right? Like a, a tuple, a string, and a list are indexed. A dictionary is keyed. And a set is neither, right? So you can have, uh, you could also have keyed and indexed, which, as I'm thinking about it, I believe that is what Lua's table type is. I think it's a, uh, you can supply keys, but you never, you never lose the indices. I might be getting that mixed up with a different type from a different language. Sometimes they jumble together, but anyways. Uh, Sorry, <laughs> that's probably a very long answer um, to your question. I This is actually something that I think about quite a lot. Uh, it's actually a very, very interesting, very good question, like why have all the types? Um, and it's I think it just, it comes down to a design philosophy, a design decision in the language. You know, like do you want to have like you know, like a macro mega configurable matrix of options for a collection type, you know, but what that might mean is that every time you declare a new collection, you might have to say, okay, so this is a collection, uh, it's immutable, uh, it's um, ordered, it's uh, indexed, it's keyed, uh, uh, something like this. You might have like this long configuration every time um, in order that Python could decide definitely what it should do with that thing. Uh, or it would have a default assumption. The other option is that just that you you figure out which configurations are useful and you give them names. Cool. Um, which is what Python did here. Anyways, so types with too much power may end up being dangerous, like while loops. Uh, Lord of the Rings <laughs> reference. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Um, if there were one type to rule them all, it may, <laughs> it may, uh, things might get weird. Um, but yeah, like I said, I think different languages have 
try different things in this particular regard. Uh, I've always wanted to, I am sort of tacitly working on designing a language myself as a, as a long-term project, and uh, that's, that particularly is a, something I, that I would like to experiment with, so. Anyways, um, yeah. All right, uh, so, yeah, so sets, back to sets, all right. <laughs> I know I gave, gave that really long answer, but oh, that was a fun one, though. All right, so with sets, we have, um, like I said, they're unordered. They're, um, they only can contain unique values. Um, they're also a mutable type. They are mutable like lists and dictionaries. Um, so there are there are methods to add or remove from them. Uh, there's various things. Cool. Uh, so let's see here. Did we totally? I think I think we went through these last time. Anyways. Um. Yeah, looks like we got a question. I think I'm just gonna go for the question. Okay. Third links. Okay. Let's see here. Let's just comment that out. is on importing your own files. Let's see here. Okay, so correctly call the is pi thing pi thing function from the my math mod. So I'm going to guess it's like this. I don't know what its arguments are, but yeah, there we go. Um, so I can give an example of this concept here, um, actually in the code that I'm working out of right now. So um, if, we, if we look here, I'm in my Python directory. I can list the contents of this directory. I'll list the contents. And this shows me all the files and folders. Um, I've got a lib.py. So this directory is just, I use it for teaching and streaming and just kind of generally if I want to go play around, it's sort of my, just my Python sandbox, um, just for general Python programming. Um, you know, not, not aligned with any specific uh, uh, project or something. I have those in parallel directories to this Python directory. So uh, I've got this lib.py. Lib is short for library. Um, or, you know, which is just like a module, it's just where I write my code. And then I've got main.py and notes.py. Uh, I've got uh, just some notes from my old computer and a test.txt, which is sometimes I use this text file to like uh, do file IO stuff with. So I'll like write to it or I'll read from it, just play around with stuff like that. So just got some different files in here for different things. Um, Sometimes I'll have multiple files and I want to run content from, from multiples of them. In this case, 
um, what I'm doing, I'm saying IPython, IPython3, and I'm executing main.py, right? But I'm not writing my code in main.py. This, this is m what the contents of main.py. Um, and this is just like a general little get up and running kind of kind of thing. But this is going to allow me, like, if I wanted to import something from my, a notes document, or if I wanted to uh, import something else, whatever, if I had another file that I wanted to import, uh, another Python file that I wanted to import, I could bring that in and run multiple contents, use the contents uh, with each other in here. Um, so I'm importing lib and I'm just writing in the global scope in here, right? So if I if I run something in lib, when I import lib, it's actually going to run all the code in lib. Even though I haven't told it, hey, run the code in lib, just importing it will run the code in here. Um, so if I run this, if I run this command, well, I'm going to get an error because I misspelled print. But if I spell print correctly and I run the command, then I'll get hello, right? And notice the command says ipython3 main.py. I'm, I'm executing this file, yet the code from this other file is running. And that's because I'm importing it here, right? So I can say import lib because these two files are in the same directory. Um, again, I can prove that if I say ls I'll list the contents. We can see lib and main are in the same directory. So I don't need to say, when I import it, I don't need to say lib.py, import lib.py. I can just say lib, and you know if I don't specify anything about it, um, it's going to assume that that's a Python file, which it is, and then it's going to import it. So the reason things are set up this way, and I'm, I'm bending the system in this example to work in a way that it wasn't necessarily intended, um, which is that I'm, you know, I'm just importing it and letting that import actually execute my code. But the way this is intended to work is lib is a library. So uh, imagine, so I would write my functions in lib and then I would implement, I would import lib and implement those functions in main, right? So uh, let's do, let's do something like that. Let's say, um, um, let's actually uh, we'll do this, Adam, and let's let's open another uh, lib. Let's just call it mod uh, dot pi. Whoops. That opened. in a diff oh, excuse me one second here opened in a different instance of Adam dang it All right. I want to open it in this instance ah it's gonna keep doing that okay um, let me do Apologies, let me uh, add a project folder. Oh gosh, actually it'll be faster if I just do this. I hate using the GUI. I like doing everything from my terminal, but for less. Okay, so here, oh, is it not going to open? Is it going to open for me? Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. And we'll do, there we go. Okay, so this is my, sorry about the trouble there, but this is my actual file. 
So let's say I, I have a function in lib here, and I'll write a function in mod here. Uh, I'll need to import mod. And then, so let's say in lib I say, um, we'll just say def factorial. Factorial will take in n. Um, we'll say prod equals one for i in range one, or we'll actually start at two to n plus one. Uh, prod times gets i and return prod. Right. So I'll save that definition. I'll start my file watcher again so we can kind of run on um, every time something's saved. So I saved this. So notice no code executed because I just defined a function. That's it. That's all this this document has in, in it. It's just a function definition, just some comments that it's ignoring. So I defined a function, but I'm not calling it. And let's say um, I, how would I do this? Um, hmm. I'm trying to think of something to use with factorial. Okay, I'll just do this. I'll say import lib, and uh, in in mod now I can call lib dot factorial, and we can just say ten. So first I'll just print this off. That's what's going on there. That's factorial 10. Let's do something like factorial 4 or something. Um, and then maybe in mod I could do something like uh, def combinations. We'll take in n and r. And I can use lib.factorial. I can say um, uh, return uh, lib.factorial. Uh, that'll be factorial n over factorial lib.factorial. Uh, n minus r times lib dot factorial r and then in main I could do mod dot combinations uh, 10 and 2 and I could print this out. Cool, 45. All right, so you know, here we have our factorial function in lib. We go over to mod, we import lib, we define our combinations uh, function, which uses factorial from lib, and then we go over to uh, mod, or excuse me, to main, where we import lib and mod. Um, and we use mod combinations, whatever. Um, in this case, we can we don't need to import lib for mod to work because mod already imports lib. Okay. Anyways. Cool. I'm just gonna comment all that out. All right.
All right, I guess we can jump back into sets. So as I'm looking through this, <laughs> um, I'm realizing we I think we went through all of this uh, before, essentially. So uh, yeah, feel free, if anybody's got any other questions, feel free to, to put those in. Uh, since I'm not seeing anything, I'm going to go through with sets. Okay, so sets. Um, yeah, let's just do these challenges really quick. Uh, so correct way to declare a set. Um, I didn't really give an example of this, but what I always like to do is uh, my set, whatever variable, we'll just say set and then do a tuple or a list inside. I'll usually do a tuple since it's a kind of a lighter footprint. Um, all right, something like that, and then print my set. Uh, or I'll say my set, if I want to do like empty set, I'll do set like this, right? So if I want to declare an empty set, that's usually what I'll do. And then you can see it literally prints off like set like that. Um, maybe I can just do something. Can I do that? Yeah. Oh, can I do that? Uh, it doesn't like it. Okay. That? Yeah, still gives me set just like that. One more. All right, yeah. So um, that's what I usually do for an empty set, just the set function. Um, I don't find myself doing this often. Sometimes I will, but not that often. Um, so looking at all of these, um, I'm going to say none of the above. Uh, true or false, the code set hello will create a set of, you know what, I don't know, but I th uh, my guess is true. Nope, nope, it will not. Ah, because hello has two L's in it. <laughs> See, there you go. That's a perfect example. Oh, hey, look at that. Different order every time. Hey, that's what I'm talking about. Maybe I just need to use strings. Maybe that was the whole issue the whole time. Um, oh, these are like opposite. That's funny. It's a different order every single time. So that's what I'm talking about. You can't count on the order of a set. Um, so yeah, I I kind of got thrown by this one. Because I, I was thinking, yeah, you know, a set will convert a string to a set like this. Uh, but this set that they show has two L's in it, which is not possible. So that was the, the trick. Um, remove 5 from X and add 5 to Y. So let's say... Um, x dot remove five and we'll say y dot add five. Oops, I was supposed to put my code down here. There we go. Removing duplicates. So I would kind of phrase this as duplicates just aren't represented. Um, they contain, sets contain unique items. Um, for that reason, they can be used to 
uh, remove duplicates from from objects. Okay, so this says uh, remove all the duplicates from X in the selection below, then assign the output to a tuple named Y. Uh, X should remain unchanged. Okay, so we'll just say <coughs> Y equals set X. So let's see. Oh, and a tuple named Y. <laughs> I get away with doing that? Yep. So I can just cast X as a set and then cast that set as a tuple. Nice and easy. Um, if I wanted to be all procedural about this, I suppose I could do um, for l n x if l not n y uh, y plus equals a tuple with l single element tuple we need the comma uh, so that should do it as well Meh, did not all right well shows that I know one three two is not the same as one two three. Oh, okay. So it is. Wow, that's interesting. It's it's uh. It wants the um. Sorted version. Um. Okay. So y <laughs> equals. Oh my gosh. Y equals sorted y and then we'll cast that as a tuple so there's really no point in doing it this way fine cool <laughs> all right have to do that double cast anyways not that it matters this way is truly better doing it the you know set tuple way like this obviously is simpler Okay, um, write a function called remove or add. Okay, uh, so we have, looks like we got some examples. I'll just pull these out real quick. That looks like a uh, set. This looks like a list. Uh, so write a function called remove or add that takes two values. Which will be a set. A set that will have an unknown count of numbers or letters. a list that also has an unknown count of numbers or letters. Okay. If the value in if a value in the list is not also in the set, it should be added. If the value is in the set is in the set, it should be removed. Okay. Uh, so for Pause for L in list. Let's do this. Uh, set equals set dot. Oops. Set dot. Copy. And if you're wondering why I'm putting this underscore at the end of it, 
it's because uh, set obviously is a keyword and I want to use this as a variable name without overriding that. Well, it's not a keyword, it's a function name. I don't want to override the function name. Um, or the type identifier. I just want to use a variable called set and I'm just calling it set and just throwing a, an underscore at the end just so Python knows that it's a different thing. So let's say set.copy, that means I'm going to op be operating on a different object here. And then uh, I'm going to return set. Cool. All right, so we'll say if l in uh, set, then we'll set dot dot remove l. Uh, say else let's see if not let's try add here and remove I don't know not that it really matters but <laughs> okay I liked it better the other way yes there we go Nicely aligned code. Okay, so it says this set should contain A, 2, and 3, and this gives me 2, 3, and A, right? So this is kind of a funny thing, but if I have, you might think, oh, well, I didn't quite get the right answer, right? But I, I did, because the order doesn't matter, right? So Python considers these two sets to be equal. Uh, because it doesn't, you know, like I said, the order doesn't matter. So what matters is just that it has the same members, right? So 2, 3, and, and A are both members of this set. Cool. Come on, let's see what they did. Yeah, it looks like it's the same thing for val in the list. If the val in the set, remove, uh, else add, then return the set. Uh, they didn't, this code though is operating on the, uh, the same set that was input, right? So if I do my set, I wanna take a second to explore this because it's kind of important. Sets are a mutable type, so with mutable types, we have to remember some uh, to be responsible while using them. My set, okay. So, Okay, so let's just look at what I have here. I have a set saved in a variable. Um, let's do the same thing actually with the list. So I have my parameters saved in variables here. Um, we're just going to look at the set. We're just going to print out that off. And I'm just passing those to the function, printing off whatever the function returns, and then printing off uh, the set afterwards. So with this, the behavior that we want is with any mutable type, when we pass it to a function, the what you want is that you want that function to not alter that type. Now the function is allowed to do this. Python will let you do this. Will let you uh, 
alter that type, but you, you want to write your code in such a way that it prevents that. That's what this copy is for. I don't want to alter this set. I want to alter a set that has the same elements inside my function and then return that set, right? Uh, if I don't do this copy, which the example code just forgoes the copy, um, that's the big difference, then I'm actually, if you look at the output here, it changed uh, it changed my set. So my set started with 1, 2, 3, and then it ended with A, 2, 3, right? So if I do copy, I get A, 2, 3 returned by my function, but it doesn't actually alter the set. I, the set still has its same value. Now, the, the advantage of this um, is it doesn't cause a change to its inputs, which means I can call this function with the reassurance that I, I'm certain that I know what it's going to do. I'm certain that it's going to not have any side effects and cause a change where I don't want it to cause a change. Uh, if I did want it to cause a change, I could kind of do something like this, right? I could reassign uh, my set like this, and then just print off my set, and that would cause the change. But this puts the whether or not I'm changing the value of that variable, that puts that in my control, not in the function's control, right? Um, I may or may not have, you know, wrote this function, but if, if this function was wrote uh, written in uh, a way that it's not going to mutate its inputs, it's going to give me the option whether I want to, you know, reassign the variable holding that uh, input or not, or if I just want to utilize it without reassigning. So kind of gives that, gives me more control that way. Excuse me, i got to clean my glasses up here. Okay, so this is part of that conversation on mutability that you <laughs> you all continually hear me talk about. I will keep talking about it because it's a you know it's a big one. It's one of those important concepts to understand. There we go. Okay. Uh, Cool, and I uh, just want to make another call for questions, if anybody's got any. Uh, that is the primary purpose of study halls. Um, if you're you're new, I you know, if you're coming in from the premium prep cohort that just started, if you're new to programming or anything, feel free to ask a question from you know earlier on in the materials. Uh, I have fun taking those as I do the. I, I have fun taking the basic, the beginner questions as well as the. Uh, um, more advanced questions, um, and I think the value, I think it helps uh, other people too. It's valuable for other people because if you have a question, you're probably not the only one. Um, I know we are, you know, more advanced in the material than if you're just starting and in, in learn. But um, yeah, you know, all are welcome, whatever your level is. So don't be shy. If you have a question, feel free to put it in there. Write a function called sets together. This function takes in two sets as inputs and should return the union of those two sets. That is, return a new set that represents all the items that are in either one set or the other without duplicates. Okay, cool. So, this one is going to... Uh, sets together a uh, function that takes in two sets as inputs and should return the union of those sets. Um, so I don't even really need to test this one because there's already a function that does this. Um, oops. We'll just call this A and B and oops. We'll return uh, 
a dot union b like that. So that's all we need to do to, for this one. That's the union. So this is just a wrapper for the union function. So this would be better named as set union or maybe just union. That's good. Oops. Oh, oh right, I already ran those tests. <coughs> okay, set iteration. So we're going to talk about traversing a set. Okay, so unsurprisingly, iterating through a set is performed in the same way that iterating through a tuple or list is performed. However, unlike a tuple or list order is not guaranteed, even if the order seems so. Um, this is just talking about you know that iterating through, meaning running a for loop through a uh, uh, set is simple, just like same is what you'd expect for a list or a tuple or anything else. Uh, the d the big difference is being that they are unordered uh the order the order in which items will be processed is not guaranteed so let's look at that uh, i'll just do this um my set equals set of hello world See if I can get all the characters in the right order, and then we'll say um, for for uh, elem for element do Ellie uh, for Ellie in uh, my set uh, we'll print Ellie and if we do this. Yeah, you can see we get just kind of a random ordering. If we run this again, we'll get a different random ordering. Oops. Different random ordering, right? So the, the order in which the elements are processed is arbitrary. It's, it's not random, it's arbitrary. So they, there's a good chance they m might be the same if Python decides it wants that there's an optimal way to present the data uh, and that optimal that optimization is uh, strong right that there's a if it's very much more optimal then it's going to do it that way every time which means it's inconsistently inconsistent <laughs> sometimes you know processing a set you know the order is very inconsistent and sometimes it's consistent, so it's inconsistently inconsistent. So uh, that's what I mean about it being arbitrary, not random. Random is consistently inconsistent. It's always, you can bank on it being different every time. Um, within, obviously, you know, a, a randomness generator has a probability of, you know, generating the same random output um, repeatedly, over and over again, although that probability is low, whereas if you're talking about something being arbitrary, that inconsistency is not there for its own sake, it's just there for a different reason, right? So um, the it's not about there being a probability of it being, the order being inconsistent, it's about Python is going to make decisions on how it wants to do that. and that may in certain circumstances be very predictable and in other circumstances be very unpredictable. The result is that the order is arbitrary. Hopefully that's a... <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm, I'm kind of sinking into that one because I, I find that distinction to be really interesting, the distinction between arbitrary and random. It, they get conflated a lot. I mean, you know, if you draw a Venn diagram, I guess you could say that the you know the usage of the terms or the you know the phenomenon to which they apply probably have a lot of overlap um, but they are distinct cool um, so true or false when traversing a set the order of items is always guaranteed false 
That's what I just said. Okay. Which of the below uh, options is the correct way to iterate through a set and print each element? Uh, da -da, be the, just this one. Uh, so for i or whatever element in x, whatever this, if x is the set. What will be printed on the last iteration of the loop? Uh, a solution cannot be t determined. I, I can't ever say for sure what the last iteration will be because it's a set. We don't know what the last iteration will be. All right, so this is this is uh, s unions, intersections, and difference. Uh, these are the three sort of major, use very useful things about sets. So if you've got to know, if you've got to know three set methods, if there's three set methods, you got to know it's it's uh, union. Union, intersection, and difference. <coughs> um, so I'll just cover these really quick. So this is <laughs> uh, up above where I was talking about, you know, how sets are not useful in the ways that lists and tuples are. Um, they are useful for these three things for doing set operations which are union intersection and difference there are there are other set operations uh, and we can look at this dear let's do dear set this gives me the directory of set uh, difference difference update discard uh, that's something else I think um, uh, is disjoint is subset um, is upper or, or is superset? I read that as upper set. Uh, oh, that's funny. It's like is upper set. That's funny. Uh, so is subset or is superset? Um, pop remove. Let's see. Symmetric difference. I'm not sure what that does. I'm not sure what update the update ones do either. So when I've needed set operations, the ones that I've needed uh, are union, intersection, and difference. I haven't done every kind of programming, so I won't say that the other ones aren't useful. It's just I haven't needed those. Uh, but you can go play around with those and, and see what they do. Read up on them if you want it. Um, so basically, Let's make a couple sets here. Let's say uh, set A equals a set of let's do um, Yeah, let's just do like a random string or something like um, yellow uh, tomato tornado. <laughs> um, and well, actually, here, let me steal tornado here. And let's do set B. Um, and we'll say blue tornado because tornadoes blow. Okay, um, so yellow tomato and blue tornado. So these will have some things in common and some things different. Um, so let's see what the union of these characters are. So if I say uh, set 
a dot union set b. Of course, I got to print this out. Kids these days with their print statements. Oh, 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 okay. I'm going to see some output here. There we go. Okay. So this is... This is everything that's in, in both of them. The union is um, uh, the, the set that contains everything from set A and everything from set B. Um, if I call this set B or set A, whatever, uh, we will get a different ordering than the last time we ran it. Oh, that, that's actually really interesting, right? So this is another good example of what I mean by arbitrary, right? So it gave me a different order. It, it, it produced a different order than last time, but since these are the same set, it produced the same order twice, right? So again, arbitrary, not random. It's a perfect example of what I was talking about. Uh, but all of these, all three of these are are equal, uh, and we could actually, yeah, let's actually prove that. Let's just prove this beyond a shadow of a doubt. C equals this, and we could say we could say um, print A equals B equals C equals B. Yeah, that's everything. So obviously those are all three the same. Um, uh, another good one is intersection. So intersection is all the things that are in how do I say this that's different? All the things that are only in set A and set B. So if it's in one but not the other, it won't be in the intersection. Um, so everything that's in both, whereas the union is everything that's in A and everything that's in B. This, the intersection is everything that's in A and B. So only the things that they have in common, right? The old, so look, uh, it's quite a lot smaller, right? We have space uh, E, L, A, T, and O. Elato, space Elato. Okay. And the same thing doesn't matter if we call set B, set A, or set A, set B. And I won't do the whole, you know, A, B, C equals thing again, but you get the picture. low space 8. Uh, intersection, inner join. Hmm, not, sorry, I'm not following what you're saying there. Is this like an inner join? Um, hmm. It's been so long since I learned about like inner joins and stuff. Doing uh, like playing around with database management stuff. And that was something that I got into for like a week a few years ago and have not really played around with since um, an inner join. Yeah, I don't think I remember. Yeah, but it's you can think about it, the intersection as being the um, just the things that are in common between the two sets. Let me know if that's what you were after. If you had another question that I 
missed entirely, which is possible. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see here. So set a dot intersection uh, set B. Uh, so the next important one is difference. Uh, so set a dot difference set B. So this one, the order that you call it in does matter, right? So everything that's in set A that's not in set B is M and Y. These are the only two letters that are in set A that aren't in set B. Uh, and <laughs> nubder is evidently everything that's in set B that's not in set A. So um, I guess you could say uh, set B has more unique characters. It's kind of interesting, right? Because they um, they're the same length, which I didn't do on purpose, but it's kind of a happy accident. So, All right. Um, yeah. So difference is the um, just everything that's a member of the left that's not a member of the right. Everything that's unique to the left-hand operand. Uh, I forgot to mention something about difference. Uh, there's you can do difference in an alternate way, and I am almost certain that this is just syntactic sugar. I'm like 99.9% .9 sure that this is just syntactic sugar. I don't think this has any possible difference in the way that it works at all. Um, so you can just subtract set A f or uh, set B from set A like this either way. Um, and that that is uh, just going to behave the same way as doing dot difference. To my knowledge there is no difference between that and subtraction. I tend to like to use the subtraction because it's kind of more concise, nicer. Feels kind of clean. Okay. It does, <laughs> it always kind of bothers me though. Um, I always want to use uh, plus for union, but that doesn't work. <laughs> you can't concatenate sets like you can the other ones. Um, yeah, no worries. It, this stuff, it, this stuff can be a little weird. Um, it's like the the concepts are simple, but they're they're also weirdly obtuse. Like, um, yeah, they're relatable, but they, you know, it's like once you get them, you're like, oh, that's that's all it is. But I think it's just. Yeah, just learning to think, think in in sets and like the way different sets of things relate um, is kind of the the twist. But yeah, no worries. Cool. Um, so we've got some looks like some set comprehensions here. Um, so given variables x, y, and z, uh, please assign the intersection of z. Uh, with the union of y or x and y to a new variable called a. Okay, so a equals z dot z dot intersection x dot union y. A should be 
z intersect x union y. Okay, good. That's exactly what I have. Cool. Write a function called. Write a function called interand union. This function should take two parameters called set one and set two and should return a tuple where the first value is the intersection of the two sets and the second value is the union of the two sets. Okay, cool. Inter and union. Sorry, I just realized. I'm not sure if that's going to come through. Inter and union. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I didn't realize I had my screen reader uh, voice on there. Uh, sorry about that. Um, that's the screen reader that I use all the time for everything. Uh, so write a function called intersection and union. Uh, enter and union. Uh, this function should take two parameters, set one and set two. Uh, and it should return a tuple where the first value is the intersection. A tuple, okay. Right, so we'll just do uh, my set one set two and I'm just going to do these okay That A and set B, and we'll return a tuple, which we don't need the parentheses for in this case. Oops. We don't need the parentheses. We'll just separate these by commas. Um, so this is Python's way of doing multiple returns. <laughs> it's a fancy way of saying a function that returns a tuple. Um, if you want to return multiple things, just return the first thing you want to return, separated by a comma, and then the second thing you want to return. You could, you know, keep going, return as many things as you want. Um, if you return in this way, you'll get a tuple uh, containing those elements. And you can see that's what we get here. Uh, you can see the parentheses on the outside of those curly brackets there. All right. So that should be it. Oops. Correct. And that's exactly what I have. Different vari or different parameter names, but same deal. Okay. All right, write a function called continuous set. Okay, uh, function should take a single parameter called set one. Set one. I hate numbering it when there is only one of them. It's just like a, I don't know, like a personal gripe or something. Okay. Uh, OCD thing or, I don't know. Um, we'll 
Okay, uh, true or false as to whether the set is a continuous set or not. Uh, so note on a continuous uh, note a continuous set is a set that contains all sequential integers. So for example, uh, the set. Uh, one, two, three, four, five is one, two, oh, what? <laughs> one, two, three, five is not continuous because it's missing four, but nine, eight, seven, ten, eleven, twelve is a continuous set, even though the values are out of order. The values are not in or out of order. There is no order. They're just there. Um, so I could say uh, sorted. If I use the sorted function, uh, whatever I pass to it that can be sorted, presuming it's a valid argument, and a set is a valid argument, sorted will already always return a sorted list. And I can see if this is equal to a list of the range of, uh, let's do, can I use, you know what, I don't know if I can use min on sets. Um, So let's try this. My set equals set of uh, three, five, nine. Okay. And if I do min my set, I get three. Good. And I should be able to use max if I can use min. Okay, good. Uh, so I can do up to uh, min my uh, excuse me min set one up to max and we want it we want this to be inclusive max set one uh, so to make it inclusive we'll do plus one this is kind of a beast of a of a call. Do I need to? Yeah, let's see here. Let's kind of try to clean this up a little bit. One, two, three. One, two, three. Make this a little easier on the eyes. Oh, plus exclamation point. Exclamation point's not a number. That's not the number one. Okay, I'll do that. One, two. Okay. So here we have everything that's going into list, and then here we have everything that's going into range. So I'm starting at the minimum of the set, going all the way up to the maximum plus one, because I want to include that maximum of the set in that range, convert that range to a list. Uh, sorted gives me a list back, so if this returns true, um, of course this, this set's not going to work at all because uh, it has to be uh, an int, not a string. Oops. Um, so let's just do something like Okay, so that's false. Uh, four, three, six, was I missing five? I don't know. It's true. Yeah. Okay. So that'll do. Uh, looks like they're taking a similar approach here. Uh, so they're capturing min and max and using that to gate a range plus one. Uh, then they have a, an accumulator set, which they're calling test set for some reason, uh, accumulating into that. Um, this could, they could have just made that into a set right there uh, and then seen if that's equal. Hmm. And this occurs to me that maybe I could have done this as well. That feels a little more elegant. I don't need to cast it to lists. 
Is that going to be better? Yeah, that works as well. Okay. It's a little nicer. Hmm. Yeah, cool. All right. There's that. Oh, that puts us right at uh, 5.30 for me. So this is our normal stopping time. Um, so I'll start wrapping up here. So yeah, thanks for everybody who came in and interacted. Hope it, hopefully everybody had a good time. Um, hopefully you got s some of your questions answered uh, and had fun, you know, found it helpful or fun or educational. Um, next stream will be same time on Friday. Uh, and yeah, uh, just, just to reiterate this, well, I've got, you know, a few more people in here. Uh, than I did at the beginning. Uh, the purpose, the primary purpose of this is to be a venue for you all to ask questions, so feel free to bring whatever questions you have, whatever Python questions you have uh, from Learn, or even if it's from an outside source, uh, I'm willing to take it uh, on stream. Um, yeah, and you can submit your code and for me to debug if you want to do that, or just say like, hey, I'm having trouble with this, will you show a solution? And I'll try to go through everything and um, show uh, working solutions. Uh, let's see. Yeah, <laughs> I guess that's everything. Um, Y'all have a good rest of your evening. If you're in premium prep, I'll see you in about an hour and a half. Uh, see you on Friday. Bye-bye.